Okay. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen who have joined us on this Dr. Fundi channel via multiple social media platforms. Um, my name is Dr. Fundi Lenyati. Uh, I'm a family physician by training, uh, but for my sins, I also host uh, this channel, Dr. Fundi channel, which is really a channel that's dedicated uh, towards um, improving interaction and conversations around matters health, uh, but also we use this channel uh, to celebrate some of our compatriots who are doing great things. Uh, in this month of August, being Women Month, we decided that uh, we will have a feature uh, or a series that we call The Future is Female. Uh, and that's a feature which we started already from the 1st of August, where we celebrate, uh, we profile one woman at a time, somebody who has done great things, somebody who continues to do great things, and somebody who still will do great things uh, for the country and the world. So today we have a special guest, Dr. Mamaila uh, Libia. Um, she is a qualified pediatric cardiologist who hails from the Limpopo province. That's my in-law province, all right? So I've got a special place uh, for Limpopo, all right? So she is a heart specialist that works with children um, who present with severe heart, uh, you know, clinical problems, which may be problems that the kids are born with, we call that congenital, or problems that the kids uh, acquire after they have been born, uh, you know, leading to heart defects and other problems of the heart. She's currently working from the Nelson Mandela Children's, you know, hospital uh, in Park Town. And also uh, she has got a private practice at Musamed Private Hospital, which is in Modern Fontaine. Now, a little bit about her, she qualified as a medical doctor in 2007. So she did her undergraduate degree at the University of Cape Town Medical School. Thereafter, she came back to Jobeck, where she did her internship, um, you know, rotating between Helen Joseph uh, Hospital and also Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital. That's between 2008 and 2009. Thereafter, she had to do a year of community service and she decided to go back to her home province of Limpopo, where she then worked at the Pulukwani Hospital, which is a regional hospital, and also Mangueng Hospital, which is in TEF. She spent a year there. Um, and what's important about her as well is that besides her, you know, being a doctor, um, she's also a wife uh, and also a mother of two boys. All right, so she's got a full life beyond being a, a pediatric cardiologist. She's always wanted to be a heart specialist. Um, what I read is that she got inspired when she was still at primary school. She got inspired about the story of the first heart transplant that took place on the 3rd of December, 1967, at Hortes uh, Hospital in Cape Town, uh, led by um, Dr. Chris Barnett. Now that was the year when I was born. Uh, that happens to be the year that uh, Professor Bang uh, Bongani Mayosi was born, you know? And most of the things that he did in his space as a clinician scientist in cardiology, uh, you know, um, somehow one can link them because even the first heart transplant for kids uh, was done a few days, I think on the 5th of December, 1967. And then there was also another, uh, you know, important thing that happened in cardiology in 1967 as well. Um, I think it was um, something to do with the bypass, you know, a coronary artery bypass graft. 
um, you know, which was the first one was done also on that year. So there seems to be something to do with 1967 and cardiology. Uh, but uh, so that's the year that inspired you that, you know what, when you grow up, you will do something in cardiology, you will be a heart specialist. And when you went to varsity, when she went to varsity, she fell in love with internal medicine. That is, she was not so attracted to anything that had to do with cutting, you know, and that is surgery. Uh, and so she really was just interested in internal medicine. And that convinced her that being a, a physician and even better, a super specialist uh, as a cardiologist is what she wants to be. Uh, she also mentions that uh, she was inspired by Professor Nancy Shipalan, uh, who actually convinced her that she needs to uh, choose pediatrics uh, you know, as a field where she will become a cardiologist. That is, she doesn't become a cardiologist of older people or adults, but she becomes a cardiologist uh, you know, of children. Now, children is you know, anything up to about uh, you know, 12 years of age, uh, I'm not sure if things have changed since uh, the last time uh, that I got to know that. And she's, um, you know, after she had spent some time uh, in Bulugwani, she then went and spent six months at Khuroteskir, uh, no, no, sorry, at um, Red Cross a Hospital in Cape Town. Uh, and she fell in love with kids um, and, you know, dealing with kids and their families. And she was even more convinced, such that six months later, she came back to Joburg. She became a registrar or a specialist in training in pediatrics at Vets University. Once again, uh, working um, at Chris uh, Hani Parakwana Academic Hospital and also Charlotte McClaig at Joburg Academic Hospital. She qualified as a pediatric as a pediatrician, 2014, as a cardiology uh, pediatrician. Uh, in 2018, that's about three years ago. And this year she concluded advanced, you know, certificate qualification um, in cardiology, pediatric cardiology. And she did that in Toronto, Canada. But she's not done. She still aspires to become a clinician scientist to one day wear that red rope, uh, you know, uh, having qualified with a PhD degree. She's already been recognized by the Mail and Guardian in the top 200 young people in South Africa. She's already been recognized by the Destiny magazine uh, in the top 40, under 40. But also, she's been recognized by Discovery Health, uh, you know, as the next best thing when it comes to, you know, cardiology, you know, medicine in South Africa and the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Dr. Mamaila Libia. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fundi, for that beautiful introduction. Yeah, you know, um, I need to tell, you know, our viewers here that we are Facebook friends, right? Now, as Facebook friends, you know, each one of us, they, you know, we post whatever that goes through our mind from time to time, good things, not so good things, you know. Um, but two days ago, you actually posted, um, you know, on your Facebook page that um, you want to talk about yourself. You want to talk about yourself as a pediatric cardiologist. But somehow uh, you feel uneasy about talking about yourself you know, uh, because to other people talking about yourself, it's like you are bragging mm -hmm. and you are not that kind of person who likes to brag, you know. Um, you said you wanted to talk about yourself uh, because you are one of the few black women who are actually pediatric cardiologists. And sometimes you get into situations where people look at you and they don't believe that you are the real deal. You know, they think that uh, you are actually fake, you know, um, you know, and uh, all right. Yeah. So, you know, it's very, very important then that, you know, um, we learn as people to talk about our achievements, 
without feeling guilty. Mm -hmm. So when I saw your post and I thought, you know what, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Livia so that we can actually talk about herself, uh, talk about herself and her achievements without her feeling that, you know what, she is bragging because mm -hmm. everything we'll be talking about today is what she has already achieved in her 37 years of life or 36 going into 37 years of life. And why not talk about that? Already by age 33, which is the year, you know, when Jesus passed, you know, passed on, you know, <laughs> you became a pediatrician, you know? So you had a major achievement already by age 33, but you were not done. You wanted to get more and uh, you became a cardiologist at age, you know, um, uh, sorry, what was this now? Yes. Um, I don't know if I got this thing wrong. Uh, you were a pediatrician at age 29. Yes. And you were a cardiologist at age 33. Yes. All right. And now you have an advanced, you know, qualification in cardiology at mm -hmm. age 37. Not many people can actually boast such, you know, achievements mm -hmm. under the age of 40. And you still want to pursue a PhD qualification in the not so distant future. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, but before we get to those serious issues around your qualifications, the work you do as a pediatric cardiologist, I want us to start at where everything began. Mm. Your family. Mm. Where were you born? You know, where were you born? How big a family were you born into? Were you first born, middle child, last born? Uh, what kind of a child were you growing up? Okay. So um, I'm a woman who's coming from Shotoli village, uh, which is a beautiful village of the rain queen Mujaji. Hey, what's the name of the village? Village. Yeah, Ilibitola village? Kishotong. Kishotong. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the village of the rain queen. We are famous for making rain. Yeah. Um, Yes, I'm proudly from there. Um, I was born uh, there at Chotoni as the first born of two children. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I grew up there, went to school there at Chotoni Village uh, until I left for high school to go to Marobatuta High School. Let's, 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 let's take it easy, dog. All okay. right. So you did your primary at Chotong, you know, yes. primary school. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Now, back to the family. You yes. are the firstborn of yes. two children, yes. right? Now, as a firstborn, firstborns tend to have a certain, you know, stereotypical, um, you know, personality associated with them as deputy parents, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who always want to look after and be overprotective over their younger siblings. Would you say you are the stereotypical, you know, firstborn child who wants to make sure that you do everything by the book and, uh, you know, make sure that the ones that come after you, uh, you know, are always led, you know, to do the right things? Yeah, I can say that because, um, yeah, I've always been, uh, that child who was very disciplined. And I think also like my name, Mama Ila which basically means waila. You, you, you don't like, like, it's a woman who doesn't like things that are out of order, corruption. It's like someone who prefers um, doing things the ethical way, the right way. So mm -hmm. I've always been, I followed after my name. So I was very disciplined at home, even at school. I think growing up, I've always been that child that even other kids are uh, looked up to. And when they discipline them at home, they'll say, look at that one, she's doing things the right way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I was a deputy mom because uh, my younger sister came immediately after me. So there's yeah. only one year gap between the two of us. And we used to, to fight quite a lot because she used to think because she was born in, 1986 and six is bigger than four so she's older than me <laughs> so i wasn't quite a deputy mom but yeah so i grew up in a loving family um growing up in a village like they say it's really not a cliche that a child is raised by a village 
I yeah. really felt like I was raised by a village because when we came up from school, we used to play with other kids, be raised by the grandmother next door. Really growing up at, in my village uh, was a beautiful thing. And I'm very proud about it. And I keep saying I'm the girl from Shoton village, which other people say, why do you keep referencing the village? They think I village in Namara to me is the pride of growing up in village in a village surrounded by so much love raised by not only your your parents but the yeah. whole village being your parents beautiful beautiful so if we reflect on those early days of you growing up Koshoto mm. uh, with the, you know uh, your 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 nuclear family and the extended family what would you say are the three values that were instilled in you that still help you as you navigate life today? Um, I think it will be giving, uh, being of service to others, um, respect and hard work. I think yeah. growing up, um, I would honestly say I was in a being, growing in a village, I was surrounded by a sea of poverty. However, yes. despite people that were very poor around me, they mm. were also the most generous people. And mm. that really touched my heart. Like just seeing my aunts who had so little, but yet will take every opportunity to give. And mm. also just seeing like, I think the women that really raised me, they've always been of service to others. And yeah. that really touched my heart. And even when I went to the scriptures and I saw what Jesus was teaching, I'm glad you mentioned Jesus and my <laughs> qualification age. And, yeah. you know, I learned the value of being of service to others. Mm. And yeah, and respect, like where I come mm. from, they are the most mm. respectful women. And I think for me, that really it like stood in, out for me. And it's, it's one value that I carry in my heart. Mm. So Liwe and our own um yeah some panic but i also like hey i i, I thought sometimes they were extreme <laughs> so yeah katanyana you know some of the things that we do in our culture where when mm. that come home you give them yeah, 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 you, you kneel down uh, and you, <laughs> as you are bringing food and, and you hey. do that yeah I know I have to track those things. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I, when I was also trying to read about you, you know, in preparation for this interview, I mean, you mentioned that you are a hardworking person. Uh, you are very dedicated. Once you put your mind into something, uh, mm -hmm. you see it to completion. Mm -hmm. uh, you give your all to any assignment that uh, you have been given. You love your work. And as you deal with kids, you don't only focus uh, on the child, but you see the child in the context of their family. So you actually, uh, and, and that's not always possible with, with, with you guys uh, as specialists, you know. Um, I'm saying this as a family physician. So that's actually the approach that, you know, is supposed to be core. Uh, you know, where you'd see your patient in the context of the, your family, the society mm -hmm. they come from. Uh, mm -hmm. And so as you are trying to help them, you look beyond the patient and sometimes look at the environment to better understand the presentation, you know, that's in front of you. So I was actually happy to, to, to see that. And um, you said uh, every day it's an opportunity for you to do your best and be brilliant in whatever that you do mm. uh, and serving others. To you, it's a form of praising and worshiping blessings you know, from God. So mm. what you are saying now and what you know, I picked up as I was preparing, it's exactly the same thing. And this is how it should be. You, know, you should be the same person, you know, um, whether you're at home, you're at work, you know, we must see the same you know, there's a consistency that must be there, you know, so um, I'm actually quite happy about that. So uh, hard work, uh, serving others, what other value would you say um, drives you from home? I think it's passion. 
like yeah. I don't do things that I'm not passionate about. So when I do something, I do like I like you already said, I give it all my height. And most of the projects that I do, they are not difficult for me because yeah. for me it's joy to be doing them. So mm. it's something that I mastered quite early on um, yeah. in my life that only do those things that you are passionate about. You know, yeah. there are a lot of opportunities out there that I could have taken in life. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 no matter how, how good the opportunity looks, as long as I'm not passionate about, I will not take it. And other thing is just perseverance, you know. Um, mm. I think, mm. You know, mm. I think I, I, to me, I believe that people who succeed in life are not necessarily the most gifted people, but yeah. are those people that dream about something and really want to achieve it. And yeah. like, no matter what comes their way, they persist until they mm. achieve that dream that they, they want to achieve. Mm. And, and you've already, you know, demonstrated that, you know, once you focus on something, uh, you will not let it go up until you've completed that. Mm. All right. Okay. So growing up, what did you want to be um, before that story, uh, age 11, when you read about what happened in Khrotesquil? Before then, what did you want to be? Oh, I wanted to be, at some point, I wanted to be a policewoman. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought I wanted to protect people. And mm. then also early on when I was in primary school, I wanted to be an actress. Wow. I was quite good in, in acting when I was, I used to, to be in, <laughs> in some village by scops that they yeah. used to take their shops and stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So um, there's an artsy person, you know, in you waiting to be awoken somewhere there within you. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, no, I was quite an actress back in the day, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, okay. All right. So um, you wanted to be a police, um, you know, at that time. But then, age 11, yes, you yes. were reading a story or mm -hmm. reading a book, and then you came across this thing that happened uh, at Fortescue, and that mm -hmm. changed your mind totally, and mm -hmm. it gave you focus. Tell us about that. So I was in actually in primary school um, in standard five. I think it's grade seven now. Then yeah. we used to read these short stories. They were not too detailed. And yeah. then this particular one stood out for me, the story about the first heart transplant. I think the healer in me was awoken during that day. And mm. I remember the following week, one of our teachers asked us to write an essay about what we want to become one day. And I, I really described in detail how I want to grow up and to become a heart specialist. I mm. should say, at that time, I didn't know the difference between cardiothoracic or cardiology. And um, honestly speaking, that story didn't even say that the heart surgery happened in South Africa. It yeah. was only years later that I discovered it was actually in our own country, in our backyard. Mm. So I remember after the story, I told my mom that I want to be a, a heart specialist. And mm. he actually warned me and said, my child, I hear you want to be a doctor. You, uh, however, our financial situation is quite difficult. In mm. order for you to become a doctor, you need to work hard. By mm. the time you get to metric, you need to get good results such that bursaries will be fighting over to take mm. you to school. And mm. I really took that advice to heart. And from that day, I started pushing myself and I was already studying up to midnight because mm. I really wanted to achieve that dream. Mm, mm, mm. And that was good because then it made you to understand the situation of your family. Many yes. kids, um, you know, uh, they don't understand their family situation mm. and they go, they get opportunities um, and they don't optimize opportunities, you know. So you understood your family situation uh, and that for you to achieve your dream, you're going to need to put more effort into your studies so mm. that your results are excellent and you can be able to get, you know, that um, bursary uh, or scholarship. Wow. Okay. 
All right, let's move quickly to then um, high school. Where did you do your high school? I did my high school at Marubatuta. It's a um, yeah. Zion Christian Church School in Boyin Moria. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I did uh, at grade eight to grade 12. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and it was very nice to be in a Christian school. It really also grounded me and instill some of the principles that I live by. So you are a practicing Christian? I am a practicing Christian, yes. Okay. And, and I'm, yes. <laughs> That's beautiful, that's beautiful. All right, so you went into that school. Uh, was it a mixed school or a school of only girls? It was a mixed school, but they were very strict. We were not allowed to interact much with boys beyond the classroom. So you could only talk to boys in the classroom. After that, if you are caught talking to a boy, you would be in trouble. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so you did your, uh, you know, secondary education there, and then you got uh, your matric. Um, mm -hmm. What year was this now when you got your matric? It was 2000. 2000. All right. Okay. You, you got your matric. 2001. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so just in the you know, new millennium, you became a matriculant. Now, some people, when they are in grade 11 or grade 12, they start being you know, confused about whether you know, they should go for this or that professional career, you know, even though some of them may have had already a decision of what they wanted to do, but they get confused. Uh, you know, in grade 11 and grade 12. For you, was there any confusion? There were no confusion. I think when I was in grade 12, some of my teachers spoke to me about changing and considering engineering as a career because yeah. at that time it was the in thing to do chemical engineering or civil engineering. I was very good in mathematics and physical science um, more than I was in biology. And it yeah. seemed like the obvious thing to do was engineering, but my heart was set on becoming a doctor and it was hard for me <laughs> to change at that point. All right. And so you applied to which institutions then? So, I, yeah. You know, I only, I applied to many institutions, but when it came to the time to retain forms, I didn't have the money. So yeah. I had to choose the one university that I wanted because when, I don't know if, if it's still the same, when you were sending back forms, you needed to pay 300 rand. Uh, yeah. So I couldn't to all the universities. So I only sent to the University of Cape Town. And why UCT? Not that there's anything wrong with UCT. I'm just interested in what made you choose UCT amongst the, the many other institutions. Uh, I think there's about eight, uh, or there were eight medical schools that time. I think we're now somewhere around nine and 10. You know what? I wanted to go overseas. So if I couldn't uh, go across the sea, then I, <laughs> Cape Town was the, the best option. <laughs> What was the attraction overseas for you? It, you know, it was just that childhood thing that I'll get matric with good results and I'll go and study abroad. Um, and also I was inspired, my dad had a master's degree from Leeds University. So yes. that thing of going overseas was like already planted in my, in my, in my head. And what my grandfather used to boost that I'm so smart, I'll study and go overseas. So I think it was in my mind and I realized, okay, it looks like I can't afford to go overseas. Let me just be close to the sea. <laughs> By the way, uh, today, uh, one of my um, you know, friends, um, Professor Salome uh, Masumi, yes. uh, she, yes. po she posted that um, you know, UCT has just been rated the number one you know, uh, university in Africa yes. uh, by four or five different rating you know, uh, 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 groupings. Uh, so yeah, uh, I can understand why you, 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 chose, you chose UCT. You know, it's still you know, um, rating quite, quite well uh, you know, in the continent, not only in South Africa, but in the continent. Yes. And for you, I mean, you've just finished your advanced certificate in cardiology. And you did that in Toronto, Canada. So at least there is some qualification uh, behind your name, a qualification that comes from Orkant, you know? 
So at least uh, you, 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 you are achieving some of the things you wanted to do. You know, you already have a qualification from uh, beyond South Africa on the other side uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. All right. So you got to UCT, uh, which is plus minus uh, 1,700 kilometers from Puluguan. Hmm. Now that transition for you, how was it? You know, when I went to UCT, I just turned 17. I was a 17 year old um, girl. Um, I remember when I passed matric, uh, it was very difficult. I didn't have money to go to um, varsity. I remember that trip very well because my mother had to borrow the money from one of our relatives. Um, and there was another young lady, my friend, who had also passed from this, um, the village near ours. I traveled to her home. Her parents were not convinced about UCT. We, we didn't have money. They also, her parents didn't have money. At that point, we were even uh, planning to uh, stand by the road and ask for money to go to school. So yeah, traveling, that journey to, um, to, to UCT, I still remember that first trip very well. And getting to UCT, ooh, I really felt like Johnny comes to your back. I was just so overwhelmed, <laughs> you know, coming from the village and then you are going to this big, beautiful city with big buildings. Yeah. It was it was quite overwhelming. And yeah. the other challenge is that despite us having had good results in metric, I struggled a lot with communication in English. So yeah. to communicate was a challenge. I should say hey. the first three years were difficult. Because <laughs> 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 where you were coming from, now yeah, you yeah. must you must speak English uh, through your nose, you know, all the time. Uh, or if it's not English, it must be Africans. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, no, it was quite an adjustment. And then coming from high school, where we, where I did very well, and then I get there. So now I found like the first three years of medicine, what was challenging was it was, it seemed like psychology and there was a lot of English. So yes. each time I was studying, I spent reading the Oxford dictionary, which yeah. was not very kind because you check one word, then you need to go check another word and then yeah. check another word. So you, a lot of time was spent on the dictionary rather than my medical textbooks. So mm. it was quite an adjustment and just, the first year was hard because when I got to varsity, I really like I literally left the village with nothing but three a borrowed three hundred rand. I think it was three hundred rand and a bag full of dreams. I didn't know how my fees were going to be paid. I just told my parents, "I'm going to UCT. I'm going to do medicine, no matter what." Mm. Unfortunately, because of the metric results, I had an entrance scholarship that allowed me to study for the whole year without. But still figuring how to pay the fee. So I was very uh, stressed. I was very anxious, not knowing uh, what the future will be like without any guarantee of um, scholarships. I remember I even, I used to Google a lot, applied for bursaries, even one of my favorite soccer team, I applied to get funding for my medical. Which, 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 is, that, which is that team? I'm interested to know. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I put them on the spot because they please never do. Respond. Please, please do. Please do. <laughs> oh, it was case <Kaiser> Chiefs. <laughs> hey. All right. So you, you asked them to assist. Uh, did they come to the party? No, I never got a response. But in their defense, I don't even know if that address I used was valid. I was just yeah. Googling any company that I knew of you know, applied, even like non-governmental organization that came back and said, no, we, we are also just surviving on fund, on mm. donations. So uh, yeah, it was a, it was a tough first year. Mm. Just, I, just, I, I, I just want to say something silly here. So you are a case chief supporter, uh, mm -hmm. and now you are also a cardiac specialist. You know, and I think uh, your skills could be better used uh, in helping <laughs> the fans of that team who have not been doing very well, you know, in recent times. <laughs> yeah, I know they've been struggling. Pity I can only deal with small hearts. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So um, 
there was a bit of difficulty in the trans in the transition issues relating to tuition fees and and other you know things that you needed it was a bit of a challenge but you were still you know focused that this is what you want to do um and so um did you eventually get a bursary because there's somewhere where you say you were nearly excluded uh, because uh, you didn't have the funds so was this during first year or further on in your studies so in my first year i attended the whole year without having any plan of how i was going to pay for the fees the year ended uh, So even for second year, I traveled from Zanin um, to Cape Town without knowing my results, but just having faith that I passed. And I remember going to second year just to attend with other people. But I, I was, you know, when I was young, I had so much faith. I remember on the I day- was, I, I, was, I was about to say that, that you, you demonstrated a lot of faith, you know, mustard seed kind of faith, you know, that moves mountains, eh? So I remember registering one of the most painful experience of my life was going to register. So I had faith that God will make a way. So I stood in the queue to register and I remember getting the turned away and they said, mm, you can't register. You haven't paid for your fees. For your yeah. fees. I left. I cried a lot. I went to the bathroom. I cried a lot. And then I think there was a deadline. It was the end of January that I needed to vacate the residence if I hadn't paid for my fees and to stop attending. But on mm. that particular day, I remember saying, I, I told God, I am not going home without my degree. I remember... Mm. Um, I went to middle campus, that's where um, a fees office was. I went there, I was going to beg those people to keep me from, uh, from uh, away, like to keep me in varsity and not financially exclude me. I walked into the offices and then when I got there, my fees were paid and I owed 50 rent, mm. which I didn't have. And I had to call my father, I said, please send me 50 rand to save me from academic exclusion. Mm. And he sent me that 50 rand. I'm sure they were not gonna exclude me without the 50 rand. And I think God wanted me to remember that moment that even a 50 rand I didn't have. And mm. then I managed to pay and I managed to stay at adversity. And it was that day when I said to myself, I'm not going to Shotun Village without this degree. And now yeah. that my fees are fully paid, I'll become everything that I have purpose to become. Yeah. And that's why for me, I keep saying that joke that without a PhD, I'm a dropout. So yeah. I need to go out because he saved me that day from yeah. being excluded. I owe it to myself or to even to God to become, yeah. to get the highest qualification possible. Mm. You know, uh, what you just said now, um, that, you know, there is a common thing in social media where, you know, somebody, I, I saw this about a month ago, somebody said, everybody uh, is supposed to attain the highest qualification, which is a PhD. And uh, if you stop along the way, then you are a dropout, you know, uh, and you've just said the same now, uh, but obviously that's a tongue in cheek kind of comment. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also uh, the, the VC, of UCT, she's also known to say Ulalanjani ungena PhD. How do you fall asleep when you do not have a PhD? So, but anyway, um, I'm I'm glad that you know um, you are not just saying um, I've got my peace cardio. Um, I'm fine with it. Uh, you still have another goal to stretch yourself towards, and it's an attainable goal. Uh, it will happen in God's time you know, and uh, just continue doing everything that will make sure that you get there. So um, did you get to know who actually paid those fees? Yes, I got to know who was my blesser, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going to disclose in this platform. <laughs> all right. No, 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 no. Um, look, um, maybe all I need is, is it somebody who knew you? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a, a, a professional within the university? Uh, I don't necessarily need the name. Is it somebody who just said, I'm going to help any child who has got a financial problem? And I want to also understand, you know, uh, did you try NES first? You know, I just want to understand, was NES, was it 
and FSAS or something like that. Um, was it already there at that time? No, it was already there, but you know, NEFSAS at that time, yeah, because they don't fully assess your circumstances. Yeah. It, it's like they look at the income of a parent and they decide that you can afford, and they don't look at the whole circumstances of that income that they are looking at, how many families are being supported by it. So yeah. although maybe on paper it looked good, uh, the reality was I had no plan to afford my, 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 my fees. Your, your, your studies, yes. So you were more of what they call the missing middle. You know, yes. mm. you know not, you know, uh, you're not poor to the extent of qualifying for NESFAS, but uh, also in a situation where uh, it was difficult to come up with the funding, you mm. know. Mm. Yeah. All right. No, I understand that. All right. Now, I just want us to, to press a pause because there's a couple of comments that have come through from people who are watching. That will also give you just a break uh, for you to just, uh, you know, get that glass of water um, and just listen to what people are saying, those who are watching. Noamisa, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, doctors. Uh, the first comment that we have is written by Dr. Boitumelo Palati. She wrote, shine on mountain queen with love emojis there. And the second one is from Bongi with Jay Berkling. She wrote this on YouTube, um, which is thanks doc. And the third one is from TD Hua Tang. She wrote, uh, yes, when I girl with love emojis there. And another one is from Siwela Tivani, which reads, we are proud of you, Dr. Libya, with the heart emojis as well. And then another one is from Lebohang Molebadze Chilone, um, who wrote a product of Ma Maroba Torta with the praise hands emojis also. Um, now the comment is from CD, uh, Hoteng again, with laughing emojis. She wrote, Kaiser Chief Scholarship for Medicine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then we have another comment from Ely. Uh, who wrote, you have done well for yourself. Congratulations for the smiling emoji. And another one from Kindi, Mte China. Um, so proud of you, my Mela, with praise emojis. And um, Nyembezi Moseto wrote, shine, black girl, shine, with praise hands emojis. Such stories need to be told and shared. Another one from Balim Shongo, who wrote, oh, wow, with praise hands there. And uh, Ole Ole Bocheng wrote, Dr. Livia is such an inspiration to all with a heart emoji. And um, another one from Infant Soul Productions who wrote, so proud of you, my friend. The last comment is written by Mimi Mabota who wrote, so, so proud of you, Mohozi, with praise hands emojis as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nwabisa. So yeah, um, so many people are feeling your story, you know, Dr. Dr. Libia, you know, and uh, it's even, you know, for me, um, interesting that uh, my guest on Sunday last week, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Pagati is actually one of the people who are listening to this conversation today. Uh, and it's very important that, you know, um, as, as a people, we support each other, you know, it's very, very important, you know, um, there, there, there is, you know, for some, or there has been for some time in our profession where we tend to compete more than collaborate, you know, uh, and not, you know, rise and lift others as we go up. So for me uh, to see two high achieving, you know, female doctors, uh, you know, in South Africa actually encouraging each other. Uh, you know, to go forward. I mean, it's, it's something that uh, we need to encourage. Uh, you know, you guys are trendsetters, you are trailblazers in, in, in your chosen, you know, in your chosen careers, and we need more. You know, when we say the future is female, indeed, the future is female. You guys are the majority in this country, you know, so actually leadership in almost any facet of life should actually be uh, by women. But uh, because of all the challenges of patriarchy uh, is not always possible, 
you know, uh, but you guys are there to open the doors uh, for others. All right, let's quickly move through uh, university. Um, did you actually want to, uh, you know, specialize in PEDS or you were confused between PEDS, uh, you know, and internal medicine? Because I picked up somewhere that there was a bit of confusion. Uh, and uh, only when Prof. Uh, Shipalane, you know, convinced you that you said, okay, I'll do PEDS. But in your mind, you enjoyed internal medicine. And I mean, internal medicine uh, and PEDS is, you know, the difference is just, you know, broadly, broadly, you know, the, the, the age cut. And in fact, when I was interviewing um, Professor E.T. Muhokong, um, you know, which is <laughs> Professor Muhokong was the first uh, gynecologist, black gynecologist in South Africa. He mentioned that during their days, there was no separation between pediatrics um, and internal medicine. You know, it was just one thing, you know. Um, so, so, but uh, nowadays we've got pediatrics, uh, which ends at a particular age, and then above that, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, internal medicine. So, so yeah, um, so what were the disciplines that you really enjoyed most in undergrad? So can I just take one minute just to calm down my child? I'll be back. One minute. Oh, okay. No, I'm that's sorry fine. about that. No, no, no problems. Um, thank you. All right. Um, I think, uh, Marisa, are there any other comments uh, that are out there that we could read in the meantime? Um, yes, Doc, we have two more. The first is written by Ulani, Ulani Maswangaiki. Uh, he wrote, uh, we are so proud of Dr. Livia, the breed of the village, the pride of the name. However, she left out the Messiah who paid her, who paid her school fees <laughs> with the laughing emojis there. And uh, another one is from Masetsana Marone, who wrote, so proud of you, Mamanya. Shine bright like a diamond, my sister, with heart emojis. The last one is from Maseru Mule, who wrote, so proud of you, my mentor. Dr. Libya is the reason I survived first year. Thank you so, so much, Mamaila, with the love emoji. That's all we have, John. Yes, so beautiful, beautiful. Um, well, and there she is coming back again. Um, well, you know, um, in this day of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we do a lot of work from home. And, mm. and that means we need to be able to understand that there will be times where other roles that we play, you know, uh, demand that, uh, you know, we juggle those roles. And we've just seen it now with Dr. Libia, where she had to go and uh, be a mom and ensure that the little one is okay before she could continue with this interview. Are you okay now, Doc? Yes, I'm really sorry about that. I was tempted no, no, to no, 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 no. interview at you the just... office, but <laughs> no, don't I... worry. Don't worry. You know, even if the child was on your lap, that would just still have been fine. You know, <laughs> uh, because we said you are a pediatric cardiologist, you are a wife, you are a mother to boys, so. Mm -hmm we knew that that's the other role that you play. And if that role demands attention now, then that role must get the attention now. So don't worry about that. Uh, that's, that's actually good that you did attend uh, to your child uh, because we need to balance our lives, you know, our work and our family lives. We need to try and strike a balance. So I'm happy about that. So in your absence, um, there's a few more messages that came through from viewers. Uh, and then somebody who says, you know, but why are you leaving out uh, the name of the Messiah who paid your fees? Uh, but no, please don't, don't answer that one. But I'm just saying, in your absence, uh, somebody said that. All right, so during your undergrad uh, medicine, um, I was still asking you, um, which of the disciplines of medicine um, actually, you know, attracted you? or you were already, you know, made up with internal medicine or pediatrics? So um, I was very good in internal medicine or discipline that require more 
thinking than doing. Like I was more of a um, internal medicine pediatric person. So, and also just being inspired by the late Professor Mayosi, internal yeah. medicine and adult cardiology just seemed like the obvious thing. Mm. And yeah, there was no confusion at that point. Uh, I did my internship uh, at Helen Joseph. I, I also excelled during my rotation in internal medicine. I loved every moment of it. And then the change came after I, I did pediatrics, which was my last rotation mm. at uh, Raima Musa. And then when I got a post for community service, it was also in pediatrics and yeah. also in um, anesthesia. But somehow I ended up staying the whole year in, in pediatrics. Mm. I was working there with an amazing team. The team in Polukwani and Mankwe was amazing. They were mm. led by the late uh, uh, Professor Sipelan, God bless mm. her soul. And you know, I think those people really instilled in me the love for children. That's when mm. the confusion started because by the end of community service, I had applied to UCT, Kroteskir and mm. Red Cross and I got both the, the posts. So mm. it felt like, you know, at some point I felt like, yo, um, internal medicine was that first boyfriend. Now I just found a new lover in pediatrics. <laughs> it was a struggle. I remember um, speaking to another professor at Red Cross, Prof, um, Rosani, just asking, you know, what must I choose? And I prayed about it. But there was something about pediatrics. When I started pediatrics, I just became very, like beside, you know, adversity, I might have not gotten better results as compared to internal medicine. But when it came to the work, uh, yeah. it was just for me. The way I interacted with the children, they are resilient spirits. They are like the way they are so grateful. It just touched my heart. And there was one story of the child that I once helped there at Bulukwan, very sick. I arrived and re I resuscitated, did my magic. The following day, as I walked to the ward, she ran to me and gave me the, you know, the warmest hug. And I think when I had to make the decision, that child is the one that made me choose uh, pediatrics eventually. And mm. I had to go to Red Cross and let the Hrotesquil post go. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, when people talk about why they chose pediatrics, they tell you, you know what, with peds, if you've done the right thing and uh, the child has been healed, mm. it will show. There is no faking that you have improved, you know, <laughs> generally with kids. Mm. Because with adults at times, you know, there may be other issues, uh, you know, um, that may make that person uh, not to want to show that they have recovered because maybe they don't want to go home, uh, you know, uh, quickly if they were admitted and stuff. All right, let's move quickly, Doc. Uh, so you spend your time uh, comsev in Mangwing. Uh, and the uh, Purugwani, and uh, you then went to um, Red Cross Hospital. You did six months there, and you were even more convinced that this is what you want to do. Um, came back and uh, did a registrarship um, at Charlotte Matlake and Chris Ani Paraguana uh, under the Vets Academic you know, uh, Complex. Um, and uh, you were able to do that in almost record time, or if it was not record time, in, by age 29, you became a pediatrician, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you decided, you know what, I'm just proceeding. Let me go and do my cardiology as well. Now, um, but there's something that you mentioned that um, you found yourself as a rose amongst thorns, yeah. all right? Uh, when you were doing cardiology, for some reason, it was still male dominated. Um, you know, talk to us about that. You know, in the context of this month being Women's Month, just talk to us about your experiences being, you know, uh, the only female uh, amongst, uh, you know, the thorns uh, that were already in the department. Um, firstly, I must just correct that I was, there was a registrar 
who once said that I'm a rose among thorns. And you know what, with all the respect to my male colleagues at that time, they were totally amazing. I think it was just a phrase that was used. They were not thorns at all. So when I was training at Baraguana, at that time, I was the only girl who was doing uh, pediatric cardiology. And I should say it must have been after a very long time that they had trained uh, a female cardiologist in that unit. So, um, you know, many people who train, who are trained by males will have a lot of complaints, but the, the situation for me was different. I had yeah. amazing teachers. Um, um, yo, you know, I become emotional when thinking about it. And one of them is um, the late um, Dr. Dumani, who yeah. really inspired me and saw the best in me and pushed me to be as excellent as I can be. And yeah. uh, Professor Antinjana, who is my boss at Nelson Mandela, you know, those people were, you know, they were not phones at all. And I'm very grateful to, 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 to the knowledge that they imparted. You know, they really looked after me. I was like really well um, treated. I was like, you know, the younger yeah. sister of the team, everyone wanted to ensure my comfort. So the yes. training was not challenging. Is I think I started feeling like, okay, being a female cardiologist is not as easy once I graduated and I started working. But with the training, because of the caliber of men I, I, I trained with or I was trained by, I really enjoyed it. And I can say I really had the time of my life training at Chris Ali Baraguana Hospital. Beautiful. And, you know, it's good to hear such stories, you know, because like I said, I mean, there's a lot of challenges in many spaces uh, because we as this gender, uh, we don't make it easy, you know, for your gender, you know, in terms of, you know, creating opportunities and ensuring that, you know, things uh, work well. So I'm happy to hear that you know, um, the thing about thorns and roses, it was not really that the thorns were actually, you know, piercing you, but you know, as a manner of speech, you know, uh, that's, that's why the other, the other doctor said, you are a rose amongst thorns, not necessarily that they yes. were piercing you in any way. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, one thing that is a highlight, when you got your cardiology qualification, hmm. you got it with a distinction. Tell us about that. <laughs> so, um, I've always been hardworking and I put my best in all my exams, but anxiety was my, my worst enemy because I should say in, on almost all my exams, it's almost like I was missing a distinction by one, yeah. by two, by, and, yeah. and I remember my pediatric exams, I think there were a lot of expectations coming from uh, the unit I trained in because I mean I, I I was working hard and there were a lot of expectations but I worked so hard that I was overwhelmed and and I messed up in the last minute I remember one of the props say H you dropped the ball so by yeah. the time I did pediatric cardiology I was pregnant with my first yeah. son mm. and I think those pregnancy hormone really calmed calm me down and I had unfair advantage of an extra brain. <laughs> So, so when yeah. I did my exams, I really, uh, I, I, I know I did well, especially the, the oral component of the exam. And when mm. people are joking, they say, ah, those guys felt uh, sorry for you because you were almost due to deliver. So they just let mm. you pass. But yeah, I think, I thank God because for me, because I wanted cardiology so bad and to exit with a distinction after almost always coming close to a distinction in all the other exams I'd, I'd written. That was like for me, like, oh, and you know, a, one of those moments, I think in my life I had uh, these uh, episodes where they are like God moments where yeah. I, I always have to remember what the Lord has done. Like those mm. moments that you cannot forget. The time my fees were paid, the time I was 10 from registration, the time I finished my exams, with a distinction while pregnant, there are those aha moments that I can say only God can do it. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. And then, you know, you went further to do your advanced, you know, qualification in cardiology. And uh, you still got it in Canada with a distinction as well. Yes, that was, um, I wasn't physically in Canada. It was, a, I was, we were studying yes. while in the country. 
Um, yeah. I think for me that one I had an unfair advantage, having been trained in the best unit in the world, Chris Hani Paraguana. I think mm -hmm. it was a given to get a distinction for that one, you know, um, just the teachers that I had in the country. So I think as South African, we, we, we don't really see how blessed we are in terms of the hospitals we have, the teachers we have. So by the time I went to an international platform, my home teachers have prepared me so well that that exam, that uh, uh, course was just a walk in the park. Wow, wow, wow. All right. Uh, and you know, we, we sometimes as South Africans, uh, you know, underestimate ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there you were testing yourself you know, amongst, uh, you know, the best in the world, in the globe, and you actually excelled. And what did it mean to you? Um, I think for me, <laughs> at the, when I did that course, it was just so one of those things I'm doing because now my goal is on getting the PhD. And I should say before I did that course, I, was, I had received a scholarship to go and study full time in Canada, do electrophysiology, which I decided to defer and not, and not do. So for me, that course was just like, a, you know, a, by the way, what I really want, my eyes are now on a PhD. Really, yes. I was just doing it for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you spend time, um, you know, between Busamet, where you've got a private practice, um, you know, I think you went in, was it a few months ago? When yeah, did you set yeah. up the practice there? Yeah. Uh, you know, a few, a few months ago, and um, you've got a nice logo that you came up with uh, about a week or two ago. Very beautiful <laughs> logo. It shows the hut at the middle of about four, you know, children who are very happy, you know, with your interventions. Um, yeah, so you, 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 you divide your time between Musa Med and also Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. Tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you are doing at Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. You know, um, most of us, we hear about the hospital, but uh, we haven't set our foot there, or our feet there. Uh, and we know that uh, it was not just developed for South Africa, but mm -hmm. it was also developed to make sure that uh, the rest of the African continent you know, uh, if there are kids, you know, who need the interventions that are there at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, then they can be able to access those. So it is Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital and also Red Cross, you know, Children's Hospital in Cape Town. So just give us an idea of the kind of, you know, um, institution that it is, how different it is from the institutions that were there before, uh, the amazing things that you guys are doing, and specifically you, what is it that you're doing? Okay, first and foremost, let me say that um, I got a scholarship to study cardiology uh, through the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. I'm very grateful for that. So I should say I was one among the first people to, to, to be employed there. So because we were trained with working at Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital uh, as the main thing for us. And uh, what a blessing it has been, because when I got that scholarship, I had also bought into the dream of Nelson Mandela when he, when he dreamt about having a ch another children's hospital, a hospital that will not only serve the children of this country, but the children of Africa, the children of the world. So I was very excited to start working there as a pediatric cardiologist. I joined my, my current boss, Professor Nsinjana, and we worked together in establishing a cardiac center. So mm. our aim was to establish a center of excellence. And mm. I thank God that I, I, I believe I played a major role together with my boss in establishing that unit. And we have really grown from the first patient that walked into our unit to where we are now. I mean, the cases that we are doing we, I mean, the numbers have gone up. I think we, we are becoming internationally recognized for the work that we are doing. Patients are coming all from SADC, mostly SADC. I mean, at the moment it's SADC. We haven't reached the whole of Africa. So as a cardiologist and a pediatric cardiologist, what we do is basically looking at children with congenital as well as acquired heart disease. We diagnose heart problems. We do intervention where we can. In those patients that are not suitable for the intervention that we do, we refer them 
for, for surgery. There are many surgical procedures taking place in the hospital on a weekly basis. Um, we see patients all the way from Limpopo province, where I come from, from Northwest, from, free, from other provinces in South Africa. So, you know, I'm very grateful of the work that we have done there. And yeah, and I still believe that hospital will still achieve great things. Um, mm. I, I don't know if, you know, you must stop me because once I start, I don't stop. No, no. I want, yeah, because you know, I wanted you to give us a sense of the kind of facility it is oh. as, you know, comparing it with the hospitals that you trained in. You know, Charlotte Matlake, Chris Ani Parakwarath, Rahima Musa, uh, you know, just, you know, because those who are there, they tell us that it's a hospital like no other hospital. And it's been designed around kids. You know, it's colorful, it's got places for this and that. You know, that's what I'm saying. Just give us a sense of the facility, uh, the equipment that you guys have got access to. Uh, one of my former business partners, um, you know, uh, Pastor Josie Olwane, uh, who started my business with me uh, in 2000. He's actually a board member of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and he's actually been instrumental uh, in actually setting up that hospital, including what equipment must be there, you know, raising the funds and all of that. So he always tells me about the magic uh, that is in that hospital. So that's why I'm asking you, you know, about it. It is a beautiful hospital. And it, like, when they were building it, they had children in mind and it's a family centered unit. So we have a beautiful accommodation for parents who come from far places. Um, in terms of, faci um, of facilities, we've got the best facilities. Our cat lab is well equipped by plane machine, a state of the art. And even our uh, cardiac OPD, we've got beautiful equipments there. So it's really a, a beautiful center that was um, created with children in mind. As you walk around the hospital, it's bright, it's colorful. There are these inspiring messages. There's pictures of an old man, which I think when I look at them to encourage myself, I, I, I think of Nelson Mandela saying that to us, like, mm -hmm. I am proud of you. As you walk around after a long day, you come across this picture that says, I'm, pride, I'm, a, I'm proud about what you are doing. So it's such a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I loved working there. Um, I recently started my private practice, as you are saying, which I'm about to uh, focus on. I'm about to leave the Nelson Mandela Hospital because for me, as I already mentioned, uh, I'm excellence driven. So at some point in time, I felt like my attention was divided. So I was no longer giving my full attention to this project and that project. So I decided for some time, I want to focus on establishing my own private practice. Um, mm -hmm. I'm starting a cardiac um, service at the Busamed. There's never been cardiac services there. It's just one of the few hospitals in private that is going to be offering such services. So I'm very mm -hmm. excited about the new project at, at Busamed. So um, Dr. Pagati is at Busamed. You are also, eh? doesn't she do some work at Busamed? She does, she does. Do yes, it. and now you are also going to set up at Busamed. So it's, it's, it's going to be like this uh, private center of, you know, um, you know, black excellence, uh, if I have to use that. And the owners of the hospital, uh, what Dr. G and others, you know, uh, it's, it's this black people, you know. So, yeah, I'm actually quite, uh, you know, uh, glad that... Uh, you know, you guys are getting into spaces and you are occupying and making those spaces, you know, centers of, of, of excellence. All right. So, um, but now in terms of, you know, research and, and things like that, are you involved in any research? Uh, and when you are in private practice, will you have an opportunity uh, to develop that side of you? 
I'm glad you're asking that question because part of the reason I'm leaving uh, my public work sector work is because I felt that I don't have time to do certain things that I love doing, uh, research included. So when I was at Nelson, uh, Nelson Mandela, I managed to do some research and publish uh, um, some case series and um, which actually did well. One, the, one of the studies I published um, became the, uh, one of the photos became a cover picture for the journal. So I was very excited about that. But because of the working hard in uh, at Nelson Mandela, also trying to find myself in the private sector, I didn't get time to really dedicate myself to, 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 to research. And that is something that I want to venture into when I go into full-time private practice. I think this for me is just an opportunity to limit what I do and focus on other things that that um, I love doing, like reading. Um, I want to be a doctor that practice evidence-based medicine. So when you are very busy, you find yourself just doing and without, you know, reading a lot. I, I think that's what I didn't like about my setting of being a private and public sector doctor. So now with the time starting on the 1st of October, I'm looking forward to that. I'll have time to, to myself, to my family, get to read, and also really um, to think about that PhD that I'm dreaming about. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, but then other people will say the best place to develop your research skills in, is, is actually within the academic environment. So don't you think you will be losing something by being 100% in private? No, you know what? I've realized it's about what you do, really. It's um, for me, if I, like I've already said, if I want something, I will find ways to do it. Even if, if it means uh, collaborating with the people in academic centers. And yeah, yeah. so for me, I, 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 don't, I don't prescribe to what's to the norm. If I want to do something, I, I can go outside and still manage to do that. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I always ask people that I interview, you know, um, as you are going up, what is it that you are doing to lift up the others? So same question to you as well. As you've been uh, at uh, the various hospitals um, and now at Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital, you know, would you say you have cleared and opened the path for more you know, black women cardiologists, you know, a pediatric cardiologist to come up? I'll say most definitely. And starting, like, looking at the time when I trained in pediatric cardiology, I think there was a lot of fear with doing cardiology. Um, and since I trained in that, I think it, it has shown a lot of our young black females um, that it is possible to do to follow a career in pediatric cardiology. I think the way I just handled myself during my training inspired a lot of people. And I even have a, a, a mentee that I love very much who recently graduated. I remember when I met her, she told me she wants to do cardiology. When she finished her training in pediatrics, she wanted to consider something else. And I said, young lady, your dream is to become cardiologist. What, what about following that dream? And when yeah. I heard about post, I notified her, I encouraged her. And really I'm beaming with pride today, looking at the cardiologist that she, she has become. Um, like, yeah, a special shout out to her, Dr. Popira Polu. I'm very proud of her. There are other people that I'm, I'm a mentor to. Some are still in high school. Some are still trying to get into uh, medicine. Uh, really, I, I'll say, inspired by those who went before us, the, the likes of Prof. Mayosi, uh, the yeah. likes of Prof. Velapie, Chris and Baraguana, the likes of Dumani. I think for me, I will try my best to include, to, to draw other young Black people into this specialty and helping them whichever way I can. Yes, you've just mentioned the two of the guys uh, who came from my high school um, at St. John's College in Umtata. Um, one being Ustembius uh, of Velapi. He was in the same class as my brother. Uh, he did his um, he did his standard 10, which is grade 12, in 1980. You know, eh? if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 1980. Um, and then Ubongani uh, Mayosi, you know, obviously he was a class ahead of me, but then he 
took a detour of an extra year to do a, a BS, I think it's a BSc med or something like that. Um, so before he could finish medicine, he already had a, an undergraduate degree, he rejoined us in fourth year, and then we were together until, you know, the final year. So both of those guys, you know, um, very good people. You know, um, it, it, it's a huge loss that uh, we lost Bongani, but in his 51 years of age, he had done so much more than other people would ever be able to do in their lifetime. And uh, Stemis of LRP is doing great things as a neonatologist, you know, uh, you know, down to earth kind of guy. And uh, so I thought, no, let me also give a shout out to my former St. John's College, you know, alumni uh, who are, you know, I mean, you've just mentioned that uh, both of them in one way or the other have influenced you know, your career and uh, obviously Stembiso will still continue, you know, uh, to be somebody that uh, is in your space as a pediatric, you know, uh, cardiologist, although he's just a, a, a neonatologist, but uh, he's got wealth of knowledge and experience. All right. So you are setting up a practice that's like a business now, yeah. right? There is not going to be guaranteed salary, you know, that one gets when you are in hospital. Yeah. All right, so um, any anxieties about that? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, business can be challenging. You need to go out there, make people know that I am here mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I can do. Um, and uh, yeah, so any anxieties, but because now you need to be in very good terms uh, with pediatricians and, and GPs and other people, you know, to make sure that, you know, those kids uh, who require your expertise um, are actually referred to you? Um, <laughs> there is a bit of anxiety, but me being me, I, I always follow my heart and I had to look at the situation and ask myself, am I happy with the setting? Yes. Uh, of working both public and private. So for me, I think the one thing is providing excellent service. I think the moment I realized that my attention is divided, that was eating on me. Unfortunately, yes. Dr. Fundi, because of poverty, Poverty yeah. is a weapon of mass destruction. So yeah. I had to choose another way of empowering my family, not yeah. only my immediate family, extended family. And I think for these uh, few years that I'm taking off to focus on private, is just to also, you know, lift the, the burden of poverty from my family. And yeah. if, 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 if I was born, what do they say in English? If I was born with, with a silver spoon, I would be choosing a different path. I would be doing my PhD, I wouldn't even be thinking of private work, but because of uh, the need to for, for financial, you know, growth, yeah. you yeah. can't, at some point I was overly uh, educated with a, a negative bank balance. So that had to change, <laughs> if I was to be honest. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, so, so basically you are saying uh, before you continue with your dream towards being a, a PhD graduate, um, there's some black, black text issues that need to be addressed. In summary. Sorry, I lost you there for a second. Okay. Uh, no, I'm saying, um, you are saying there are immediate black text issues that need to be addressed so that you can rejoin the academia and continue with your PhD. Exactly that. So if I could, if I could be in a situation where I could do both uh, the private and the public, I would definitely do it. But I need to do them both excellently. But I was in a space where I felt like I'm not doing both excellently and had to choose. And also I had to choose one that will allow me a bit of quality of life. Especially yeah. I'm a mother of two small boys. One is two, one is three years. I felt like I was never there. And I, I'm in a, a space where I feel like I need that time if, if I need to take them to hospital, I need to take them to crash, I must have that time. So it's just the phase that I'm in. But then uh, I also had to look at myself, like at some point there was a guilt with doing private work. There's always this thing of working towards my community. And when you talk about community, you talk about poor communities. But yeah. there was a realization that even in private, I will continue saving my community. 
you know, it might not be the same community. Now it's a paying community, but yeah. I will still be making a difference in the life of children and their families. Beautiful, beautiful doc. You know, um, no, I, I, I really understand, you know, the choices, tough choices you've had to make, uh, but, you know, you are driven by the need to excel in whatever that you do. And obviously, uh, with all the challenges that you raised earlier, you know, there is a need, you know, to, um, you know, lift the family up in many ways. Uh, and if this will allow you to do that, uh, you know, because your dream really um, is still attainable and luckily you are still young enough, you know, to be able to, uh, to, to chase that dream. So uh, I'm encouraging you to, to continue. Because, you know, where we come from, uh, parents, you know, uh, they say, yeah, wanna wanna, hey, king you know, uh, you know, the child is a doctor. And there's a certain expectation with that, you know? Uh, so yeah, do a bit of your black text and then and, and come back and continue with your dream. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, you know, you can't be lost 100% to the public sector, I'm sorry, to the private sector. So you will have to find a way to have the balance, you know, um, because uh, uh, there's very few of you out there. So let me just check if there are any other comments from other people who are supposed to finish this interview um, in 10 minutes time, which is at half past five. So let me just check if there are any comments uh, so that uh, my staff member can be able to read those. Okay, Noamisa, you can uh, read. Yes, Doc, we do have a couple of comments. The first is from Mimi Ma Maboja. She wrote, indeed, women have a lot on their shoulders raising children, progressing in their careers and taking care of their mental health. Halal Abasadi. And um, second one is from Charles Mamabolo, who wrote, so proud of you, Dr. Livia. Keep up the good work you are doing. And then another one is from Siwela Tivani, who wrote, uh, thank you, uh, Doc, for motivation. I refuse to be a dropout. I'm going for that PhD. <laughs> with our heart emojis there. Yeah. And uh, another one from Bulani Maswangani. Um, I believe God heals um, in many ways. There are those he touches directly, and then there are those he uses uh, to touch others. Doctors serve the other purpose of healing uh, God's children. Her presence in NMCH together with other doctors acknowledges the existence of the powerful God. I hear in her journey, things happened miraculously, and in that you see God. May her God keep her more indebted to save and heal the nations in large. And then another one from Edward Boga wrote, she speaks with proud passion. She is grounded. The roots of, of this tree run deep and high will her achievements be. We will watch and cheer. And then another one from CD, um, Hoseng, wrote, you made a hard work seem easy. From high school, your success was somehow aligned and, and guaranteed. I cannot imagine you being anything else other than what you are right now. Keep on shining and show it off. We are motivated by your success, Dr. Livia. Another one from well again, Dr. Livia giving glory to God in all her conversation is the highlight for me, with the praying hands emojis there. And another comment from Samantha Gandhi. So inspired by Dr. Livia, um, we see you and we are motivated to, to do and be better. Your passion is so tangible. Also, God moments in remembering what God has done. May God continue to bless you with praise hands and hearts there. And another one from PD, Deshana, Uzo Busa E Busamad. I'm not sure if it's Busamad or Basamad. With the, yes, with the, with the hearts emojis there. And then Siwela Tivani, shine, must see a shine. And last one is from Golan Masangani. Dr. Fundi, thanks for reminding her that she can't be NMCH at any time soon. Oh no, <laughs> she is highly needed there with crying emojis. The very <laughs> last one again from Infant Soul Productions. Your story always inspires me, my friend. Keep inspiring young women. 
thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, so you, you are touching so many people, Doc. You are so real. You know, sometimes we tend to want to hide some of the challenges, you know, that uh, we have gone through in our journey to success. Uh, and, uh, you, know, in, you know, in all of the things that I've read about you, you don't hide that your journey to the top has not been a very easy one. But then, you know, as you were walking that journey, there was an invisible man, you know, who was walking and uh, holding your hand, and that is God, you know. And uh, with your faith, you know, um, you know anything is possible. Uh, and uh, just continue doing good. So we already know, I was going to ask you what's next for you, but then you've already told us that uh, you still have uh, another goal of getting that PhD. Um, and um, do you see yourself at some point, uh, you know, becoming a professor uh, within an academic environment uh, or, you know, um, with limited private practice, obviously? Um, most definitely. I mean, at some point, I think I'll, I'll definitely leave private practice and go back and focus on academia. Mm. Um, with the professor thing, I think I started seeing myself as a professor, even when I was in medical school. I'm yeah. that girl who used to sit in front, right in front with the profs yeah. during presentations. And yeah, and even like, you know, walking the streets in the hospital, I've always had people, especially coming from older uh, uh, patients and uh, older colleagues and declaring prof Libya. I think mm. that for me, it's, for me, if I get to that point, it will be like, yeah, the cherry on top of every achievement that I've made so far. Uh, mm. But no pressure. Like I told you earlier that even by the age of 60, I can still get that PhD. God yes. willing. Me, and yeah, <laughs> there's no pressure of the timing, but yes. God, no, yeah. no, no. There, sh there shouldn't be pressure. You must do it once mm. uh, you know God has inspired you uh, yeah. and you have a clear problem that mm. you want to solve and bring in you know, a new knowledge to the body of knowledge that is out there, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, wait for that inspiration. As a praying woman, as a woman of faith, you surely, you know, uh, will get, you know, that inspiration, you know, from the man above. Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm going to ask you, we've got five minutes to go. Um, what's your favorite scripture and why? Mm, I have so many favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I'm not good in quoting. No, I'm no, that's in, nice. in quoting, rather paraphrasing, I like Jeremiah, I think it's 29, where the God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans mm. to prosper you and not to harm you. I love the scripture which says, You are wonderfully, wonderfully and fearfully made. Before you were born, I knew you and I saw you when you were still in your mother's womb. You yeah. know, and I like when I combine with that one, they give me so much courage that God knew me before I was born, before I was, you know, I was born, when all I was born. The, all the challenges you are going to encounter in your journey, he already <laughs> knew about those challenges and he already had ready-made solutions. All you need is to access him, you know, yeah. uh, you, know you, 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 you kneel down, talk to him, petition him as the father that he is, you know, and uh, wait for the appointed time, you know, for him to deliver, and he always delivers. And uh, funny enough, uh, that scripture that you've just spoken about, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, you know, uh, you know, only I know the plans I have for you. That's my favorite scripture as well. You know? so, so I was smiling on my own as you were quoting it there, you know, because you know, in my journey of ups and downs, you know, it's one of the scriptures that, um, you know, I've, 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 I've really, you know, um, quoted and used in petitioning God, you know, that in your good book, this is one of the things you say and uh, make it happen, you know, because you are a God that never lies, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also Habakkuk, uh, I think it's two, from mm -hmm. two to four, which talks about the vision. vision you know? like yes, and it uh, talks about you must, you know, write it down, mm -hmm. med meditate on it, 
uh, and then at the appointed time, it shall manifest, you know, I'm paraphrasing obviously as well, you know, and uh, those are the two for me, and maybe the last one um, being, uh, I think it's from James, James 1, uh, basically about faith and then not being double-minded, you it, know, it, uh, and persevering and you'll be crowned with glory and all of those kind of things. So, yeah, um, it's good to interview somebody who's God-fearing, um, you know, like you. And, uh, yeah, uh, all I can do, uh, you know, as somebody who dropped out, uh, <laughs> I only went up to master's level, but uh, I'm making my way towards a PhD as well. Uh, COVID did mess me up. Uh, I was supposed to submit my uh, concept note. Um, you know, already had a, a supervisor out there. So, but anyway, uh, this is not about me. This is about you, Doc. I just want to thank you for, you know, giving us time uh, to talk about yourself you know, uh, without feeling guilty, because that's what you said in your, AF your Facebook post. You mm -hmm. want to talk about the wonderful, brilliant pediatric cardiologist that you are, the mm -hmm. excellent cardiologist that you are, that looks after children. But you get, you know, feelings of guilt that you may be seen to be boasting, you know, and bragging about that. There's no bragging. You're just telling the truth. Uh, and so I hope in some little way, this 90 minutes of talking to you about your work and your vision and the fact that you are a person who doesn't do half measures will mm -hmm. actually get out there and your colleagues, uh, you know, uh, pediatricians or even GPs can actually make sure that that practice of yours at Musa Med thrives all right uh, you get blessed more than you think you are already blessed so with those words i just want to thank you doc uh, for agreeing to be interviewed by myself uh, but also i want to thank everyone who has joined us to just listen to your beautiful inspirational story a story of somebody who has been driven by faith you know, from the time you got admitted at UCT, all the challenges, you know, that you went through there, uh, and even beyond, you know, the people that you've met along the way who made an impact in you, like late, late Prof Shipalana, uh, you know, who I'm sure she's smiling, you know, watching you doing the great things uh, that you are doing. There's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called uh, Outliers, uh, and in that book, in the first chapter, it really talks about, uh, you know, the fact that most people, when they are asked about their success, they always own their success as if it's 100%, you know, their own abilities. Mm. Yet, no one gets to the top without somebody who chipped in, you know, and created an opportunity or chipped in in this way or that way. And so for you to so openly, you know, uh, acknowledge others who have been, you know, um, useful uh, in one way or the other in your journey, who've made things happen for you, it just tells us a lot about how grounded you are uh, and the fact that, you know, uh, you see those people being used by God to actually make things happen for yourself so that you can achieve your dream. So may you continue to do good. May your practice prosper, um, you know, and um, at some point, please come back to academia as well. So with those words, thank you very much. Uh, Noamisa, is there anything else that has uh, come through or all the messages are gone? Noamisa? Okay. Um, um, Doc? Are there any more messages uh, or we can proceed uh, to conclude uh, our interview? No, we don't have any more comments. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Noamisa, and thank you, Dr. Libia. Uh, all the best uh, with all your endeavors going forward. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Tomorrow, uh, I will be hosting uh, a classmate of mine uh, from St. John's College, 
um, you know, Dr. or Professor Nomandra Madala, who is the head of department of internal medicine at uh, Sifako Mahato University uh, and George Mukari Hospital. I had to drag her kicking and screaming because she doesn't like you know, publicity. But anyway, she will be here with us at four o'clock tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we'll be reminiscing about our journey from high school uh, to medical school, qualifying together back to Umtata as interns. Uh, and then she decided to proceed uh, and get an internal you know, medicine qualification and later became a nephrologist. So that's my guest for tomorrow. So if people have got time to be inspired, um, please join us tomorrow, same place, same time. Thank you very much. Thank you.